This is a lecture for BCIT's Technology Teacher Education 4044 class. We're taking a look at structures, and in particular, the structure we're taking a look at today is the syringe excavator that we've been building in Fusion 360 over the last series of recorded uh, lectures. And uh, so now we've got our uh, syringe arm model all worked out. So the idea is that we're building a syringe controlled uh, excavator. We've got the bucket down here. It's going to have to reach into a, uh, in into a pit and dig out plastic beads to represent dirt and use uh, fill up a dump truck. So uh, we're limited to controlling it with three syringes. We've got a 30 milliliter syringe here, a 20 milliliter syringe right here. The the uh, end arm out here I haven't filled in yet. I've just represented it as dots at each of the nodes because we were using that to manipulate the uh, bucket down here and the bucket linkage mechanism. And what we want to take a look at today is some of the things that Fusion isn't necessarily going to be telling you in regards to the amount of forces required to uh, make this arm work. And uh, although we could run more complex simulations that would work this out brilliantly, I just want to point out some of the geometric aspects uh, and some of the physics aspects that are going on in here that make it really important that we uh, pay attention to them as part of our design. Now, before we get too far into that, I do want to refer back to some fluid power fundamentals that are covered in the Robot Arm Challenge document of the Electronics and Robotics Activity Plan book in the BC Youth Explore Trade Skills curriculum. So if you go to the mytraining.bc.ca slash youth explore skills website, you'll see right in the bottom corner a link to the electronics and robotics curriculum. And in there, you'll find the robot arm challenge that covers uh, building a syringe powered robot arm similar to what we're doing in this project with our excavator. And if you dig into that a bit more, you'll find in figure 16, it shows you a double acting cylinder, which is the type of cylinders that are used in excavators. Uh, so all real serious hydraulic equipment where you want to be able to both extend and retract the cylinder is going to be made with a double acting cylinder and you'll have pressurized uh, oil uh, flow into this side and as it flows in right here it will act across a surface area right here so your pressure times your surface area is going to give you your force pushing that piston outwards. Now when it comes time to retract the cylinder, a valve will open up allowing uh, fluid to flow back out of this uh, side of the cylinder and the pump will inject fluid into this side of the cylinder right here and it will cause uh, the pressure in here to rise, pushing the piston back deeper into the uh, into the cylinder. Uh, one of the things to note is that this does have a seal right here and our syringe does not have a seal right there. The only pressure acting on this side of our syringe is air pressure, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. One interesting observation before we move on with a double acting cylinder is that it's got more, it's got a higher maximum force moving in one direction than in the other direction. Which direction do you think it has the greater maximum force? In extending and coming out this way or in retracting and going back in that way and why do you think that's the case if you're looking for that the answer might be in this document that I have referred to uh, above okay uh, let's move on and look at how this impacts our arm now the problem is is that our syringes don't suck in fact, nothing sucks. Now, that might be something that, you know, if you're talking to a number of teenagers out there, uh, they may take you to task on that and explain that many things uh, suck. But their definition of suck and our definition of suck might be a little bit different. Uh, sucking and vacuuming uh, are just terms to refer to pressure differences. And what we observe as a vacuum here on the surface of Earth, uh, or what we observe as something being sucked into something else, 
is uh, not so much sucking as it being pushed by ambient air pressure. Okay, if you were to take our syringe and go into outer space and you were to try to retract the, the syringe by pulling backwards on one syringe, you would not see it move because there would be no ambient air pressure to push on this side right here. There would be no force to draw it back into the cylinder. And I know you're saying, well, yeah, but but as I remove water from the cylinder, something's got to make it go back here. Uh, uh, uh. If there is nothing pressing on this side, there is nothing pushing it back into there. And uh, in fact, some other things start to come into play as you start to reduce the pressure in here. Okay, so uh, the only thing we've got available to push on it at sea level is 15 pounds per square inch or 101 kilopascals. So 101 uh, kilopascals, a megapascal is one newton per square millimeter. So this is one tenth of a newton per square millimeter. So if you take a look at a square millimeter on your skin, uh, about the size of a, I don't know, a medium felt pen dot, there is one newton of force, or sorry, 0.1 newtons of force acting on there. 10 of them, you'd have one newton and a hundred of them. So a hundred square millimeters or one square centimeter, you would have um, roughly 10 newtons or one kilogram of force acting on that. Uh, the imperial measurements, uh, pounds per square inch, take a square inch on your hand and there is 15 pounds of force acting on that. And what you're feeling there is actually the weight of the air in a column straight above you, a one inch square column all the way up to the outer edges of the atmosphere that weighs 15 pounds and it's pressing down upon you. Now, this is give or take a little bit as uh, various weather systems roll over top of us, uh, the pressures change. And as your elevation changes, your pressure changes as well. So if you live at high elevation, up at a ski resort or something like that, you'll find that your coffee uh, water boils at a different temperature than it does at sea level because there's slightly less air pressure keeping those water molecules inside the kettle. They're a little more free to bounce out of that. And in fact, if you go all the way up to Mount Everest, uh, not only would you die without uh, having a good chance to adapt your lungs to the uh, complete lack of oxygen, well, not complete, but the extreme lack of oxygen at that elevation, but you wouldn't be able to make a decent cup of coffee because you couldn't get the water hot enough um, inside a, uh, you know, a standard open kettle. You'd actually need a pressurized vessel to get your water up to anywhere approaching 100 degrees Celsius. It would just start to boil at very low temperature. Whether or not being able to get a good coffee on top of Mount Everest is your greatest concern. I'll leave that up to you to wonder. But uh, in any case, uh, keep in mind that people at higher elevations are going to have less efficient syringes when it comes to retracting the cylinder because their ambient air pressure will be lower. On the other hand, if you were to take your syringe arm underwater, okay, and underwater, all of a sudden water has a lot more mass, so your pressures build up, your ambient pressures build up a lot faster. And if you were to go scuba diving with your arm and you were to take it down to, oh, 30, 60 feet underwater, all of a sudden your arm would work wonderfully because now you would have the pressure of all that water above you pushing back into here and uh, your, your arm would uh, be able to retract quite nicely. Um, you, probably easier ways to solve the problem than by going scuba diving, but it's one way to do it. Now, what happens if you do pull on that syringe? You've got water sitting inside the syringe and uh, all of a sudden you're pulling on it, you're lowering its pressure. Well, and you, you know, say you're, you're holding that syringe in place, you're not getting enough force to cause the syringe to retract. Uh, so what happens? The pressure inside your liquid drops. And there's a couple of things that can happen. If you have gases dissolved inside the water, they're going to start to vaporize first. So most of the water that we uh, have around us has all sorts of dissolved gases in it because keep in mind that water is used to being at 15 pounds per square inch. Well, if you drop that water down below 15 pounds per square inch, some of that gas that has been forced into there 
by the 15 pounds ambient air pressure, the 101.3 kilopascals uh, ambient air pressure. That gas that has been forced into the water, now you're at a lower temperature. Uh, lower pressure, some of that gas can come out. And uh, this uh, happens all the time. Uh, a common thing that you might see is when you open a can of soda pop. Well, you'll know that if you take a can or a bottle of pop and squeeze on it, that it feels like it's under pressure. Well, that's how we keep all the bubbles dissolved inside the sugar water that makes up your soda pop. So, or other beverage of your choice that has gas in it. Same thing happens with champagne and beer and any bubbly beverage is stored under high pressure. And uh, so what happens is that when the cork comes out of the champagne bottle, when the cap comes off the two liter pop bottle, when you crack a, uh, uh, your favorite beer, what happens is that the bubbles start to form in there. And uh, the bubbles are just dissolved gases coming out of solution because you've lowered the pressure acting on the fluid. So the exact same thing happens if you take water and lower the pressure acting on it. Any gases dissolved in the water are going to start coming out as bubbles. A deadly version of this happens to scuba divers, and you've probably heard of scuba divers getting the bends. Well, if a scuba diver goes uh, deep underwater, you know, 30 feet, 60 feet, 100 feet underwater, the air that they are breathing in from their scuba tank has to be pressurized high enough to allow them to inflate their lungs. Well, at at sea level, we've just got air pressure pushing in on our lungs. But underwater, you've got several times that equivalent air pressure pushing in on your lungs. So the air that you breathe in has to be at several times higher pressure than the air that you have at the surface. Now, this doesn't cause your body to explode because your body is being evenly pressed in all directions. Okay, so the air inside your lungs is pushing out on your lungs from the inside and the water is pressing in on your body from the outside. But now you're like that pop bottle. Okay, you are compressed and you are able to dissolve more gas into your bloodstream. So some of those high pressure gases go into your lungs, they're at high pressure and they transfer very efficiently into your bloodstream. And your bloodstream is now at a, a high pressure as you start to come up from the water, that pressure drops on your body. Now, if you come up very slowly and you control your ascent, then the bubbles have a chance to dissolve bef uh, before they form into bubbles. The gases will just come out every time you breathe. Your lungs do a great job of exchanging dissolved gases. In fact, that's a big part of what they do. Um, so uh, your lungs exchange those dissolved gases and you bleed off that pressure slowly. But if you come up in an emergency and you come up quickly, uh, then what's gonna happen is your blood is going to be a little bit like soda pop when you crack that can open. And it's going to start fizzing and you're gonna have, fizzing might be a bit of an exaggeration, but you're gonna have bubbles form. And bubbles, what do we know about them? Bubbles rise uh, until they get caught somewhere. So you sit, ha, tend to have these bubbles in your bloodstream rise. They'll get caught uh, at joints in your body or worse, end up floating right up in your bloodstream and into your brain, causing the potential uh, for um, very serious and painful and potentially deadly outcomes. So anyways, um, liquids at low pressure uh, can be uh, can be quite a problem. Now, uh, let me just draw this chart a little bit bigger so that you can see it here. Uh, this takes a look at the vapor pressure of water. And this is what it takes to boil water. We were saying that when you're up at Mount, uh, on top of uh, Mount Everest, that you're going to have not be able to boil a decent cup of coffee. Well, this also works in a couple different directions, but let's take a look right here. At the surface of Earth, at sea level, we're at this point right here. So we're at 100 degrees Celsius is the temperature of water before water starts to transition to a gas. And that's at one atmosphere or one bar of pressure, 15 PSI, 101.3 kilopascals. Those two meet up really nicely right there. When you get up to the top of Mount Everest, okay, you've dropped down to about 0.3 bar. You're somewhere in here. Your water is going to be boiling at 60 or 70 degrees Celsius. 
So yeah, uh, no, not even a decent cup of tea. Um, as you get to higher pressures though, then it takes uh, much, much higher temperatures to, uh, to boil that water. And this is one of the reason, reasons why steam is such a use, useful way to convey power. Because if you can heat water up above 100 degrees by keeping it pressurized, you can get the water up to 10 pounds, uh, or sorry, 10 atmospheres, 150 pounds per square inch, or um, one uh, megapascal, right here at uh, 180 degrees Celsius. So you can transfer a lot of thermal energy through a steam pipe that you'd have problems moving just through a hot water pipe because the hot water pipe could never get above 100 degrees Celsius or else things would start to expand. And uh, if you get into the whole world of superheated steam and uh, uh, steam is used in industrial processes and boilers and steam engines, it's actually a really fascinating field of study. It's an entire uh, career known as being a power engineer. And I'm pleased to say I've actually got my fourth class steam ticket uh, from my time working up in the gas plants in northern Alberta. And I can run a decent sized boiler putting out a fair bit of power so long as my su supervisor signs off on it. Alrighty, um, so let's take a look at what this means in terms of maximum forces onto the syringes. So uh, the first thing you need to know when you're calculating a force that a syringe can exert is you need to know the cross-sectional area of the syringe because of course your, your pressure is just your force divided by your area. So if you know your pressure and you know your area, you can calculate your force or know any two of the three and you can calculate the third remaining one. Uh, so let's take a look at what happens uh, if we take our 10 milliliter syringe, our 20 milliliter syringe, and our 30 milliliter syringe. I popped out my handy dandy vernier calipers, took some measurements, and used that famous pi r squared formula to come up with a few different cross-sectional areas for our syringes. So on our 10 milliliter syringe, if I push uh, on my syringe to get the water up to 100 kilopascals, I can exert 16.5 newtons of force on the other end of the syringe. But with the 30 milliliter syringe, with its much larger cross-sectional area, I can exert 38 newtons of force. However, if I'm pulling, then I can not exert this much force. When I'm pushing on the syringe, the only thing that controls uh, how much uh, force I can put into there is how hard I can push and how well my hoses are attached to my syringes. I guess theoretically at some point you could rupture the syringe, but believe me, something's going to go before that happens. So uh, you, know, you can keep pressurizing uh, that syringe and you can push on it basically as hard as you want if you've got good tubing securely locked into the syringe. You're not going to have a problem. You're not likely to have a leak. The syringes work really good in compression when you're pushing on them. You can probably go up to 300 kPa. You can go hard enough so that you're going to hurt your hands before, uh, before you stop pushing. Okay, but since we're pulling and we've got to be cognizant of the fact that if we pull too hard, those bubbles are going to start to form. And once you get bubbles into the system, it's really hard to get those bubbles out of there. And they act as little springy shock absorber things. And the, once they come into the system, it's really hard to get them to dissolve back into the water. So uh, you're going to have air bubbles in your system. And uh, just like having air in your brake line or anything like that, you want to bleed that out because air is compressible and those bubbles are compressible and uh, they will reduce the amount of control and reduce the ability to uh, extend your syringes as well as to retract your syringes. So we don't want to pull on them so hard we get bubbles. So maybe we can only use a fraction of our ambient air pressure. So you know, if you're pulling at 10 or 20 kPa, you're only going to be able to pull with about one-tenth of the force on your syringe that you're able to push at. And that's just because it's a single acting cylinder and the only force we have causing it to retract is ambient air pressure, which relevant, uh, relative to the hydraulic pressure inside the syringe is not that high.
Now, up in the top corner here, I do have a question for you. Could you pull harder on your syringe if the water had a lower concentration of dissolved gases? Yeah, that's something that, uh, you know, I've been making syringe arms for a long time, and I haven't seen anybody put serious effort into exploring that. They have used some other techniques to try and get past this issue of the single acting syringe, but I really think there might be something in the concept of uh, degasifying your water, and there are ways to go about doing that. Okay, let's take a look at how this comes together. So here is a screenshot from my Fusion 360 diagram where I've got uh, the syringe and the bucket all put together, and I can pick up on this end of it and I can drag it around and, oh, here, let's take a look. I can drag that end and I can move things and tuck it together all like that. So we've got this working model right here, but we come into some situations here where uh, as I move that around, okay, oh, that's not a very useful position to be in, but as I dig down deep right here, I might be running into some problems with my lever arms. And as I move that in, I run into some problems with my lever arms. Let's take a look at what those problems might be and how we can address them. Okay, so on that screenshot on the side right there, we've got, um, uh, I'm just going to take a look at the arm right here. The arm is connected to the boom. We've got the 30 milliliter syringe raising and lowering the boom. I'm going to take a look at this 20 milliliter syringe right here because it is the one syringe that we've got in the system right now that is most likely to run into this problem of trying to somehow uh, suck back in. Um, and what's going to happen is that for this arm out here to rotate, especially when you've got a full bucket full of dirt down here, okay, and you've got this syringe extended all the way, so you've got this full of water, so you've got mass out here, you've got the mass of whatever you design your arm to be, so your arm's going to be in here. You might want to think about making that some kind of a truss design to keep it nice and light as possible, okay? Uh, you know, trusses don't just appear in, uh, in bridges and towers and things like that. It might be a really good design for your arm out here just to uh, uh, reduce the amount of material that you're having to lift. Could let you lift a heavier load down here. So we've got a few strategies to try and make it so we can lift this arm upwards. One is to keep the arm and bucket as light as possible, which is what I was just saying, you know, make this light, uh, make your arm into some kind of truss shape uh, so you don't have a lot of material out there. You can also add an elastic or a spring or something to apply tension to this end of your syringe. So if you've got an external force already pulling this back into place right here and the, the, the arm actually naturally wants to rotate up because of your elastics or your springs right on here, then all your syringe has to do is only act under compression ever. So you only ever pressurize this side and try to extend this, uh, the plunger right out here. And then when you stop pushing on that, the elastics or springs automatically pull the plunger back in. Now you've got more than just ambient air pressure pushing that plunger back in and you're getting closer to having a double acting cylinder. So so that's uh, uh, actually a couple of very uh, useful tips. Anytime you're trying to retract a syringe, physics isn't going to let you get very much force that way. But that doesn't mean that ambient air pressure can be your only source of force. Uh, the other thing, of course, that you could do is you could use a larger diameter syringe up here, but I'm limiting you to 110, 120, and 130. Uh, you could try swapping out the 20 for the 30 if you are really having a problem right up here, uh, but generally because this one is going to be acting on a much greater mass, we probably want to keep the largest surface area for the one that has to move the largest amount of mass. Now, you also have another option that you could take a look at, we followed a standard excavator design, and standard excavators have double acting cylinders. You could say that since we don't have double acting cylinders, it might make more sense to take that syringe off of the top and put it onto the bottom down here and use it to press outwards. Catch is that when you're scooping up the dirt, you still need to be able to pull inwards. So if you think about how a standard excavator is hooked up and what it's doing right here, it's trying to 
push this bucket down into the ground, so it wants to be able to push on this lever arm as hard as possible. So there's a few things coming into play that you're going to want to think about when it comes time to setting up your geometry. And while we're talking about it, let's take a look at that geometry and why it's so important to our arm and some of the brilliant things that people have actually done in designing your standard excavator arm. You know, they all kind of look the same. That's not because people are out there copying each other. It's because they have a standard solution. You look at jet planes, you know, a, a, a a 737 and an, uh, an A360 you know, kind of look alike. Uh, the Dreamliner, that, that they're all pretty similar uh, shapes because there's one pretty good formula on how to make a jetliner. And, uh, you know, there's minor tweaks and changes and improvements and uh, people have made huge strides in engine technology, but they all kind of look the same because that's the best way to do it. People have tried all sorts of other ways. Same thing with excavator arms. If you've got double acting cylinders, just copy a standard excavator arm. We don't have double acting cylinders, so maybe there's a better way, but let's take a look at some of the clever things that they do right here. And in order to take a look at what they're thinking about when they design these arms, you need to keep in mind the concept of the lever arm. Now, earlier in our studies in this class, we spent some time talking about forces and moments. And moments moment or torque uh, is the twisting uh, action about a pivot point. Okay, so this is our pivot point or our fulcrum right in here, uh, right at the joint. And we've got some amorphous shape called the arm down here. I've just represented it with these uh, two blue boxes right here, but they're fixed together to each other, kind of an L-shaped arm. You know, most likely that it's going to come down here and look something like that. You might have some kind of truss structure in here. Uh, you can be creative in how you design uh, this part of the arm. But it's going to have a pivot right here, and it's going to be attached to a syringe right here. Now, the lever arm is going to be the distance perpendicular, perpendicular at right angles, to the direction that the force is being applied. So on this syringe, this syringe and this position can push outwards or pull inwards. And so it can only move along this axis represented by that black line right there. So the parallel line to that that runs right through our pivot point is right down here. And the perpendicular distance is this measurement right here. Now, technically, maybe I should have drawn it right there to show it a little bit better where that's happening. But with some extension lines, we can bring it out here and you can see it a little bit more clearly. This is the lever arm for the syringe. Okay. Now, down here, I've taken all of the mass of the bucket, the arm, and the syringe, and I've given it an arbitrary center of gravity. How did I come up with that center of gravity? I took a look at it all, and I said, hmm, I bet it's somewhere in the middle. And I slapped it down right here, kind of in the middle of uh, the syringe right here, because, of course, when this fills up with water, that's going to be a water's dense. It's going to be a big chunk of your mass out here, depending how you design your arm and depending how big your bucket is and whether the bucket is full or not. So when your bucket is full and you're trying to lift up, this uh, center of mass right here might be out here somewhere because the total amount of mass that you're moving will have shifted. But for right now, let's just say this is your lever arm right here. It kind of runs down through the middle of the uh, syringe. And uh, so you've got this distance right here. And what you can see is that our lever arm of the mass is about eh, three or four times greater than the lever arm of the syringe. So whatever force I'm getting with the syringe right up here has to be three or four times whatever force the mass of the arm is exerting down at this point right here. Okay, so uh, th this point is important because this was uh, the lever arm and that is perpendicular to the force. Gravity's force is always, of course, vertical in our diagrams. So, so that, okay, makes sense. But what happens with our arms is that the geometry changes. Now, here's the situation we were in in our last drawing. I just copied and pasted and put that back in here so we could compare it to what happens as we retract that syringe 
and the arm raises. Okay, so here we are, the arm is down, the syringe is extended about halfway, now the arm, uh, syringe is basically fully retracted, and the arm is out at a 90 degree angle right here. Well, as that arm swung out from down here, you can see that the lever arm of the mass has increased. Okay, now it's still radially the same distance away from here, but because the arm is now out at a 90 degree angle, this is a much greater lever arm. And you can think about that comparison. If this was all the way down and all this mass was just hanging right down here, you'd have no lever arm or no torque on it at all because your you know, force would be perfectly in line with the axis of your pivot point. But as you come further and further out this way, that comes out here and becomes a longer and longer force thus increasing the distance on this lever arm. So in this diagram, this force right here, or that lever arm right there, is that distance right there, the before distance. And now we've got a new distance, the after distance. We've increased that lever arm by about 25%, meaning that we need about 25% more torque right in here than we did in this image to get this arm to rotate. Thankfully, because of the way the arm is designed, you'll see that as this retracts right here, the distance between the direction of force right out here for your uh, syringe and the pivot right here has also increased and also by about 25%. So as this arm extends up this way, it gets harder and harder to lift. But because of our geometry in here, it gets easier and easier to lift. And if you've got the correct ratios and the correct spacing in here, that's going to remain relatively constant. And you're going to be able to lift any load that you picked up down at the bottom. You should be able to lift while it's out at its uh, furthest extension. That's one of the reasons why you see this as a standard design in excavators is because as the arm swings out this way, the distance from the cylinder right here to the pivot point also increases, therefore allowing you to match your torques up fairly nicely. Because keep in mind, if the lever arm multiplied by the force of the syringe does not exceed the lever arm multiplied by the mass of the arm, you're not lifting that arm. Okay, now that's good news generally for our arm and for the uh, syringe right here that actuates it. But it's not always good news. Sometimes our geometry is such that as the lever arm of the mass increases, the lever arm of the syringe reduces. And in that case, you can end up with things getting locked into place. So watch out for the boom right here. Now, this is the same sort of diagram, but I've included our base right here. And here is our 30 milliliter syringe pushing up right here. Okay. Now, our mass of the whole arm and everything out here is, we're going to say, center of mass acting out somewhere about right here. Okay, and uh, yes, there are ways you can calculate that, and yes, there are ways that you can model that in Fusion 360, uh, maybe a bit more complex than we're going to get into right now, but uh, it's good enough to ballpark it and say, well, if it's right about here in this drawing, I'm just going to assume it's right about here in this drawing as well. And again, that's going to depend whether or not you've got a full bucket, how big the bucket is, um, how heavily you've built this arm, all sorts of factors going on on where exactly that's going to be. We're going after general concepts here. Um, on this one, I'm not, not going to make you do the math right now. So let's take a look at uh, what happens here. Now, here I've got this long lever arm when this is extended at 90 degrees but now i need to bring my boom down so i can reach down into the pit and do some digging okay now watch what happens as that comes down because we're rotating about this point right here this force goes from up here to down out over here and you can see that in this diagram that this is rotated down it's still acting roughly through the same spot somewhere near that uh, um, 
pivot point right there, but it's acting down right out here. And that, because it's always acting downwards, is now a longer lever arm, a longer horizontal distance from the pivot point of the boom back on the base. Now, that happened in our, uh, in our arm when we did our retraction, and it wasn't a problem because while the uh, after distance of our lever arm went up by 25-30%, uh, also our lever arm for our syringe went up by 25 or 30%. But the problem in this one is that as this comes down further, we see that the before distance gets reduced until the after distance becomes smaller right here. And if we keep going down and keep going down, eventually these two are going to line up with each other and we're going to have zero distance and zero lever arm for our syringe right here. And that means that even if you put an infinite amount of force into your base syringe, it's not going anywhere because there's no lever arm and therefore no torque to write this structure. Let's just take a look at how that might look if we uh, come over here and uh, let's see if I drag this down and I keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And right now you can see that that syringe, let me just spin that around so I'm looking at it from the other side maybe. You can see that that syringe right there is perfectly horizontal. It is not going to allow us to push that back up. If I try to extend that right now, um, I don't think it's going to go very, uh, very far at all. Actually, it may end up driving it downwards because I can see that my lever arm down here, if I start pushing this way, is more likely to push it out that way and drag it down like that. Okay, and now if you get down there, that's great. You're nice and deep down into the pit. But in order to pull that up, now you're into a suction action on your uh, syringe arm. And uh, that's just going to be a big, big problem for you. It's really happy in about this range of movement right here. But as you come down like that, you can see that your lever arm, the distance between that axis and that axis right there approaches zero. And when you get right down to there, you are at zero. So you're going to have a problem actuating that arm. So um, a few very practical things to take a look at while you're mocking up and laying out some of the uh, dimensions for your uh, for your excavator arms and you can play around with a lot of this geometry because uh, if you've been following the tutorials we've uh, set this up as parameters so you can come in here and you can start changing some of your parameters and you can say right if I don't like the position of uh, my uh, uh, of that base hole maybe I can put that a little bit lower down that would be base y1 and let's see what happens if we take base y1 down to 35. Oh, didn't like that. Moved it around. Actually, I think that. Let me undo that. Modify, change parameters. Yeah, that should be base y1. Is it 35 millimeters? Let's see what happens. Can we take that up to. 45 millimeters. Maybe make it a bit more noticeable. Okay, and now, oh, I've spun it around. There's the Y over there. That's going to make it worse, not better. Now you can see I'm already down at the point where the uh, where the syringe and the uh, uh, and the boom are uh, parallel to each other, and I've got no no torque acting on there. I think I want to modify change parameters. Let's change base Y1 back up to 25. Okay, and let's change uh, base Y2 out to 40. And now that's moved down a little bit more. And now as I bring this down right here, I'm still bringing that down. It can go down very deep, but now you can see that this line right here uh, uh, relative to that pivot right there, the distance in here 
is still uh, greater than zero. So I'd have to bring that all the way down to right here. And in fact, it won't let me go that low to get it all the way down to zero. So that design is probably going to be more efficient at moving my arm. And what did I give up in order to get that? Well, now it doesn't go up quite as high when I rotate in that direction. So playing with that dimension right in there and bringing that down probably makes for a better arm. Uh, now, we've made this uh, in Fusion 360 because we haven't had access to a lot of shop tools for mocking things up. One of my instructional colleagues at BCIT, uh, and bless Randy for the saying, he really likes to use CAD. And in his world, CAD involves cardboard-aided design uh, as opposed to computer-aided design. And that's a great way to mock things up. And if you go to that electronics and robotics curriculum right in here, let me uh, view this by the uh, page level. And uh, where's my zoom? Zoom to a uh, uh, fit actual size zoom to page level right here. So you can go into this document right here and it's got all sorts of information, questions for your students to do, even as an answer key, if you look carefully, don't tell the students. Uh, it talks about some of these different things about counterbalances, how you can counterbalance an arm as, uh, as well. So if you put a mass out on this side, that is the equivalent of adding a spring or a syringe or something like that, or there's an elastic right there that might act to help counteract that force. Very common aspect in the design of robot arms is how do you account for the dead weight of your arm so that your uh, actuator only needs to move the uh, live load the, in your case, the contents of your bucket when you pick things up. And there's worksheets to go through and uh, do various calculations uh, so that your students can actually spend some time focusing on the physics of what's going on here with your syringes. Uh, just before we go on, I uh, did want to point out uh, the CAD aspect of this. And uh, so there's a little uh, uh, thing in here that allows you to have your students uh, just walk through using pieces of cardboard and, uh, and tacks or uh, nails or screws to hold them together. So you can play around with some of this geometry and put your syringes in right here and you can mock it up in person and you can see some of the same reactions that are happening right in here and say, oh, well, what does happen if I put this in here and put this on the underside of the arm? And what happens if I start bending the arms? You'll notice that our boom has a bend in it. How does that affect uh, where we hook things and how we move things. So anyway, uh, there we go. There's, uh, the, it's really nice to be able to see our range of movement. And in a future class, we'll take a look at verifying that our range of movement is going to be sufficient for digging and emptying our, uh, our, our syringes, uh, our syringes, our, our bucket right in here. I don't know why that bucket is not extending and dumping for me. It should, there we go. Let's drag that down right there. And oops, something came detached down there. Anyways, the bucket's all hooked up right in there. There we go, dump. Okay, so we've just dumped our bucket into the, uh, uh, into the, uh, uh, dump truck and we're good to go. So there's uh, lots of things that you can do to play around in here, but don't forget that when you're just because you've designed it in the computer doesn't mean it's going to work in the real world if you haven't applied a little bit of real world thinking about torques and moments and forces to your design. Okay, thank you very much. And don't forget about torques, moments and forces as you design your arm.